I've been doing this for uh, more than 25 years, and before that, I was a prosecutor first for five years in the Rackets Bureau of the Manhattan DA's office, and then for nine years as the first assistant at the New York State Organized Crime Task Force. In, in my 14 years as a prosecutor, all the cases I dealt with but one concerned uh, official corruption, labor racketeering, and, and organized crime. I never served in the complaint room where cases are evaluated and criminal complaints are drafted. I appeared only once in the lower criminal court, and with one exception, I never dealt with the kind of ordinary, everyday street crime, assaults, robberies, rapes, and murders, which are now pretty much all that I see as a judge. The first time I saw a one witness robbery case with no corroboration of the victim's identification of the defendant as the robber, it, it took my breath away. Early in my judicial career, a defense attorney asked me to order a young uh, assistant district attorney to reveal the name of a juvenile who had been charged in family court as an accomplice in the same robbery his client was charged with and who not only confessed to the robbery, but had named and given a description of, of his accomplice, a name and a description that were entirely different from those of the defendant before me. The prosecutor felt compelled by the secrecy of the family court proceedings to refuse to disclose the juvenile's name. When I asked if she had spoken to the juvenile, she indicated that she had not and she did not intend to. I then asked her if without any corroboration of the defendant's guilt, she had considered the possibility that the defendant she was prosecuting was innocent. She said she had not because the complainant had picked the defendant out in a lineup and was confident that her identification was correct. I ordered the disclosure of the juvenile's name, but by then he was in the wind and the defense attorney could not locate him. As an alternative to the juvenile's testimony, I admitted into evidence at the trial the report in which the juvenile had named and described the perpetrator and the defendant was acquitted. So I recognized early on that my role as a judge was not merely to be an empire, but to intervene in little and big ways when justice required me to do so. What has surprised and troubled me most as a judge is, is the occasional ineffectiveness I sometimes see in attorneys on both sides of the courtroom. The range of talent and knowledge in the Bronx is vast. I've seen incredibly accomplished prosecutors and defense attorneys at work, and I've enjoyed sitting back and watching them perform before me and, and my juries. But at other, other times, I've been concerned by the performance of less talented and less knowledgeable attorneys, and I'm sure I'm not talking about anybody in this room, on both sides. And each time it happens, I wonder how or whether and how to step in. Perhaps the most distressing trial I've ever presided over was a rape case in which the defendant had retained counsel who displayed his ignorance of criminal law and procedure from the beginning of the trial to the very end. The victim was particularly credible and her account of the crime compelling, but the approach the defendant's attorney took at trial made matters for the defendant even worse. Promising in the opening statement to produce evidence at trial that was never forthcoming, failing to object to what were clearly objectionable questions that elicited damaging testimony, bringing out by his own questioning evidence that was prejudicial to the defendant, and making arguments in summation that had no support in the trial evidence. The prosecutor made things still worse by taking advantage of defense counsel's inadequacies, driving a proverbial truck through every hole that the defense left or it created. Throughout the course of the trial, I did what I could to compensate for defense counsel's incompetence. For example, I had numerous bench conferences with the attorneys asking why there had been no defense objection to an improper question and offering to strike the testimony. Sometimes counsel took me up on my offer, but sometimes not, instead giving me totally unconvincing theories about how the evidence would work in the defendant's favor. The New York Court of Appeals, our high court, has held that no matter what efforts a judge may make to compensate for a defense attorney's ineffectiveness, they cannot in the end substitute for a defendant's right to effective representation. And in this trial, that was certainly true. The defendant was quickly convicted by the jury, and I imposed an appropriately long sentence. And then I waited for the motion to set aside the judgment for ineffective assistance to counsel that I knew would inevitably come. And when it did, I encouraged the appellate counsel on both sides to work out a plea that would avoid a retrial, but neither budged enough to make an agreement possible. After receiving the prosecutor's response to the motion, I set aside the conviction and ordered a new trial, which occurred with a new incompetent attorney and thankfully before a different judge.
<laughs> the result for the defendant, though, was the same. Almost always the need for judicial intervention is far less extreme than it was in that case. I've sometimes felt the need to convince prosecutors that every case, well, almost every case, has two sides to it, and that justice is not always exclusively on their side. And I've sometimes felt the need to remind defense attorneys of their obligations to be in touch with their incarcerated clients, to be thorough in explaining the defendant's options, and candid in estimating their prospects at trial. As I became more exposed through the Criminal Justice Standards Committee of the impact of collateral consequences of conviction on the prospects for a defendant's future, I found the need to remind defense attorneys to consider those consequences and prosecutors to take them into account in the pleas that they offered. It's sometimes still necessary for me to re remind a defense attorney to apply for a certificate of release from disabilities so that would otherwise be an automatic consequence if a conviction becomes discretionary which would, for example, permit a licensing agency or a board while still considering the conduct for which the defendant was convicted, giving, uh, giving the board or, or uh, agency the ability to decide, despite the conviction, that the defendant can get a license or a job or, or live in public housing. Sometimes in supervising discovery, I've ordered the prosecutor to disclose more information and, and to do it earlier than what and when New York's ungenerous discovery rules require. Sometimes in plea bargaining, in a state in which there are no federal-style guidelines, but where mandatory minimums can be very high, I've urged the prosecutor to agree to a disposition I could not offer without his or her consent, but which to me seemed reasonable and fair to both sides, would avoid for both sides the uncertainties of trial, and for the defendant would permit the imp uh, prevent the imposition of a mandatory <laughs> but still unduly harsh sentence. When the law required a prison sentence for the most serious charge against the young offender and the prosecutor told me his or her supervisor would not consent to a lesser plea and a non-incarceratory <coughs> sentence, I sometimes urge the supervisor to accept a plea to the top charge with sentence deferred for a year or more to give the defendant a chance to earn a substituted plea to a lesser offense along with probation, a conditional discharge, or even a dismissal if he or she could stay crime free and meet the other conditions of the plea. As uh, hearings and trials have proceeded, I've sometimes been puzzled by what an attorney for one side or the other is doing or not doing, and I've asked myself what, if anything, I should do. For example, when I'm conducting a hearing and an inexperienced prosecutor fails to fill a gap in establishing the legality of the actions of a police officer, do I call the attorneys up to the bench and point out the omission? When a defense attorney fails to object to an objectionable and potentially prejudicial question, or ask a question of a witness that I know will open the door to damaging and otherwise inadmissible testimony on redirect? Do I call the attorneys up to the bench and ask why? When an attorney on either side doesn't ask the foundational questions necessary to get an exhibit into evidence, do I explain what to do or even ask the questions myself or just let the attorney flounder in the evidence stay out of the case? Similar questions arise when an improper argument is made in summation, but it fails to draw an objection from the opposing attorney. Sometimes the, uh, the answer to the questions I've been asking is clear, but just as often not, in particular because I have limited knowledge of the evidence available to the parties and of the strategies each is pursuing during the trial. I actually wrote an article about judicial intervention a number of years ago, which I called Above the Fray or Into the Breach. It raised all these questions and more and I find myself still seeking the right answers. Thank you. <laughs>